Okay. Hey Ian, how are you oh, doing, man? Very good, Scotty. Ellie. How are you doing? You. Well, what are you doing in the middle of the forest? You know, I sometimes <laughs> ask myself that question. <laughs> well, I'm Eileen and I'm joined today by Dr. Ian Grayson. We all know Ian, wonderful faculty at the Harvard uh, Endo Program. And Ian, what are you and I doing here in the middle of the forest? Believe it or not, we're going to discuss dental office emergencies and we're going to discuss the basic requirements that you're going to need for a dental office emergency kit. Terrific. So this is the next installment of the endodontic management of the medically compromised patient. And we're going to be talking about medical emergencies in the dental office and some of the things to do in terms of addressing and taking care of them. So that's terrific. OK, let's go. Up let's the get on with it. Okay. So, Ian, before we talk about uh, medical emergencies, I think it'd be a fair idea to talk about the incidence of medical emergencies in a dental office. And yeah. I can tell you in my 25 years of practice, clinically, it's, uh, I haven't seen too many of them. I could probably count them on one hand. Uh, and most of them are probably syncope after they get my bill. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> just not joking, of course, but I think it has a lot to do with practice composition and what kind of practice you have, right? I mean, if you have a more geriatric practice, a hospital-based practice, this is a private practice in a, or a student clinic, don't you think so? Uh, definitely. Um, the demographics of the practice is really, really important. Certainly, um, if you're dealing with a community where um, there's a high incidence of health issues, you're going to have them in your office, no doubt about it. Um, but one of the best things to do to mitigate that is to take accurate histories. And what do you think are the most common emergencies? Well, the most common one, without doubt, is syncope or fainting. So syncope is the most common, uh, but what do you think is the most significant or dangerous, if you will, in a dental office? Probably uh, some of the heart conditions, the chest pain, um, the angina conditions, uh, conditions which can lead to myocardial infarctions, um, those can have life-threatening life consequences. Um, another life-threatening consequence you can get in the dental office is anaphylaxis. Um, that's a violent allergic reaction to uh, a stimulus. Um, that can be, if it's not treated correctly, um, fatal in some cases. So very, very important to understand um, how to recognize these issues. Very important to understand how to treat them until uh, the emergency staff at a hospital who's more suited to treat them can get to that patient. So if you can provide the intermediary step in treating those patients, um, it's going to go a long, long way to making sure that everyone has a successful outcome. So pretty much uh, and dental emergencies, I think, as a macro level can be divided into those that are life-threatening and those that are not, but they're significant. Yes. Right. So that's, 100%. I guess that's what constitutes an emergency, something that requires care right. immediately. It requires, it requires your intervention um, to successfully manage that patient during that period of time until you can get outside help. So that's the type of thing. Um, so we can have things very minor such as uh, an allergic reaction which is strictly a localized phenomenon. So you'll get uh, redness, you'll get urticaria, you'll get a rash form. Um, the patient certainly is uncomfortable but at that point it's not life-threatening and that can be managed. So we're talking about emergencies, um, I, I think one of the first things that we all want to know is how can they be avoided or prevented in a dental office? What's one, of, in your opinion, what's one of the most significant factors for avoiding or medical emergencies in a dental office? Totally understand. Well, you can never totally prevent them. That's one thing. So if you could totally prevent them, we wouldn't be having this talk today. So you can certainly decrease the chances of a serious emergency in your office and you can mitigate a lot of things. And I would think that the most important thing that you can do, and I know it harkens back to something you've heard time and time again, I would think the most important thing you can do is take a detailed medical history on your patient so that 
not only do you see your patient, you know your patient. You have a detailed history of everything that's occurred to him from a medical point of view before he's come to see you. That is so important because that ultimately will dictate how you treat your patient, what kind of preparedness you should have to treat that patient, and will make everything run relatively smoothly, especially if you run into an incident um, which requires your intervention. So from what I'm hearing, Ian, is you're saying don't just go ahead and treat a patient. Take a look at that medical history once in a while and inquire more before you even start treatment. Right. Exactly. At the first diagnostic stage of you know seeing your patients, find out more about their medical history and background, their weaknesses and the potential areas where you have to pay attention. If, if a patient comes in and tells you that you know what, every time I get local anesthesia, my heart races and I feel like I want to pass out. Right then and there, you know that you potentially could have a problem. Deal with it. Don't give the patient anesthetic in a sitting up position. The an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Terrific. So have the patient on his or her head in a Trendelenburg position exactly. while giving the anesthesia. Right. At the same yeah. level, at the same level as the rest of the body. So you don't get that shortage of oxygen to the brain, which ultimately will result in fainting or syncope. True. I guess, you know, anxiety control and making sure that the patients, you know, you're not injecting at a fast rate. So if there is an epinephrine reaction type of a situation, people are not being... Uh, um, but under stress. Under stress and, yeah. you know, obviously making sure they're not hypoglycemic, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's we'll get into that later. All right. Let's get into So, Ian, uh, short of walking into the operatory and finding a patient on the floor, <laughs> how do we, <laughs> which is not usually where they belong, how do we recognize a, a medical emergency during a uh, dental visit? Well, obviously, if you can... <clears throat> assess a patient well before you start that's the most important thing but certainly changes in appearance uh, skin tones um, eye movements um, noticing breathing patterns heart rate all these are clues um, that can help you recognize that the patient is under distress and whenever that kind of um, those kinds of signs occur, um, it should alert you to the fact that you may have to step in and take some kind of action. So the first one would be syncope, followed by hyperventilation, um, which would be followed by an allergic reaction or in a more serious sense, anaphylaxis, asthma, chest pains, sudden cardiac arrest, seizures, and diabetic emergencies. Um, those are the most important um, or the most common. The most common ones, obviously, right. right. I mean, you know, the, the very important ones, cardiac arrest and those kinds of things are obviously the very important ones. Yes. But these are the ones that we run into most commonly. Right. So let's come back and talk about each one of these with a little bit more detail. Okay. So we're going to talk about the most common uh, medical emergency that you'll face in the office and that's syncope and this one topic takes up about 50 to 60 percent of all uh, dental office emergencies and it's very very simple it results from a lack of oxygen or glucose substrate to the brain it can be brought on by pain anxiety um, and it can also be brought on by a vasovagal stimulation where you can have a patient who's lying flat and they get up too quickly. All of a sudden, they feel as though um, they're going to pass out. And that's generally a problem with patients who are on any kind of cardiac medication, especially beta blockers. Um, a patient who sits up rather quickly um, can um, suffer from this. Orthostatic hypotension. Kind right, of. right. Yeah. And, and the bottom line is when blood pressure drops, um, um, and you don't get enough circulation or oxygen to the brain, um, the patient can lose consciousness. Now it's broken up into two parts. Uh, there are early signs of syncope, which are nausea, perspiration, and tachycardia. And that's generally where it stops. As soon as you take action with that, the patient will usually recover. However, if they don't recover, it can lead to the later signs, which are far more serious, involving hypotension, drop in blood pressure, bradycardia, and pupillary dilation. And, and most of these problems can be prevented by assuring that your patient has eaten a meal before they come in so they're not hypoglycemic and, and make sure that patients who are apprehensive are in a supine or Trendelenburg position when you're delivering your local anesthetic. And if in fact it does happen when we deal with management, 
we're going to place that patient in a supine position. We're going to give him oxygen, make sure that we maintain his airway, and very, very importantly, while this is taking place, we have to monitor the patient. So we have to have his blood pressure monitored and his pulse. Now, if for some reason the patient does not respond, we have to continue to monitor and then a call to 911 is indicated at that point in time. So, in beyond uh, syncope, hyperventilation is one of the more common, um, you know, emergencies that you see. I'm not sure if you want to call it an emergency or kind of a, a, a reaction type of a thing that patients have, because that's a symptom of something greater. That could be a result of even a panic attack. It could be a result of a number of other physiological things other than just psychological things. So why don't you talk a little bit about hyperventilation? Well, hy hyperventilation generally occurs to a patient who's prone to hyperventilation. You'd, of course, know that if you took an accurate medical history and they would tell you that, in fact, they've had incidences of hyperventilation. And, and would you, how would you, I mean, you know, how would you characterize that on a medical uh, record? I mean, have you had an incidence of hyperventilation or would you say, like, well, have you had panic attacks in the past? Which one would you say? I, I would say panic attack. Most people would not refer to it as hyperventilation. The average uh, person would refer to it as having a panic attack right. where they couldn't catch their breath. And that's a patient telling you that they've hyperventilated. Right. Looking at their medical history in terms of the drug, uh, drugs that they're taking as well could be helpful in terms of knowing whether someone is prone to it, whether they're taking any kind of you know, anxiolytics Correct. and things like that. Yeah, right? if they're taking any type of anxiolytic, antidepressant, anything along that line. And they tell you that... I have an anxiety I, disorder. Right, I have an anxiety disorder and I especially am fearful of coming to the dentist. Those combination of, of factors can <clears throat> uh, alert you to the fact that potentially you could, <laughs> you could have an incidence of hyperventilation. <clears throat> so speaking of that, so how do we avoid hyperventilation for patients that are hyperventilating ventilating or how do we treat it so we're going to start we're going to start with management of hyperventilation um, most important thing is to remove the stressing factor um, if the patient is staring at the anesthetic for example get it out of the patient's field of vision um, once that's done um, this is the only uh, medical emergency where you'd want to sit the patient up, so get him in an upright position. And what you want to do is, because the patient is blowing off carbon dioxide, you want to induce carbon dioxide back into the system. And we do that by rebreathing um, the expired air. So we can do it by cupping the patient's hands over their face, brown paper bag, or having them breathe into a mask where there's no flow of oxygen into the area. And generally speaking, by calming the patient, having them rebreathe, breathe, uh, we can settle them back down and, and reverse the situation. So yeah, beyond hyperventilation, let's talk about a little bit allergies and, you know, they obviously range anywhere from a little bit of dermatitis and little redness all the way to anaphylaxis being life-threatening and a serious medical emergency. How do we, again, what are some of the things that we should look into the medical history to help recognize the potential and then how can we deal with it when it does happen? Well, when, it, when a patient comes in and you do the medical history, you're going to look carefully Hopefully at the patient's profile. Does he have seasonal allergies? Is he allergic to any types of medications? Um, has he had a history of asthma before? Any of these questions where he answers positive to, he or she answers positive to, will certainly alert you to the fact that uh, an allergic reaction is a potential for that patient. Mm -hmm. And what's happening in an allergic reaction is you're getting the immune system challenged by an allergen and uh, it's responding and it's responding in a way that there are certain target organs. So in a mild allergic reaction, what you can get is you can get sort of a, a skin rash or urticaria, which is itchy and raised. Um, and that's easily treated. You'll simply remove the stimulus, uh, be it the rubber dam, um, which is the most common thing, latex allergies yeah, latex being, allergies being, being very, common. very common. Yeah. Uh, you'll remove it and cease the procedure for that day um, and give the patient an oral antihistamine regimen and you know, hopefully everything is okay. Now, in a more pronounced reaction where there's a rash covering the body, uh, you may want to go to something which is a little more invasive and give the patient an intramuscular injection of the antihistamine, which would certainly be more effective than the oral medication. Now that's for the minor 
um, the minor uh, allergic reactions. For a more major or systemic allergic reaction um, where you're talking anaphylaxis, um, this can lead to angioedema or swelling or reduction in the size of the bronchial passageways. Um, it can lead to difficulty breathing. Difficulty breathing. It can even lead to vasodilation of the circulatory system and circulatory collapse. And realistically, once you recognize this, and signs of that are difficulty breathing, uh, redness, swelling of the neck. Once you recognize that, um, because it's a life-threatening situation, you have to act quickly. And treatment for that would be epinephrine. And epinephrine is given at 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams of 1 in 1,000 epinephrine injected intramuscularly. And that patient must be monitored very, very closely. So pulse, blood pressure, very, very close monitoring in order to ensure that the epinephrine is doing exactly as it should. In many cases, a repeat dose is um, advisable because it has a very short life and once that's done and the patient is stabilized, um, the patient should be sent for emergency uh, treatment to uh, continue with their treatments. So allergies and syncope, what about the third thing, which is asthma, which is nowadays pretty common. I nearly mm -hmm. have it, had a little asthmatic attack myself <laughs> a second ago from all this pollen in the air. So. Um, what do we do? I mean, obviously, you know, you look at the medical history. Generally, right. most patients that have asthma we'll, already have it. Right. They'll write they it down it. in their medical history. It'll be known to them. And, and those patients generally are carrying inhalers for conditions where they run into a situation and, and they need to use it. Mm -hmm. And an asthma attack can be recognized um, mostly on expiration, that the patient has difficulty breathing. And especially when they're expiring, there's a wheezing sound. And as soon as you hear that, um, um, you can ask the patient to sit up, get his inhaler, his or her inhaler, and in fact employ it. Um, you should have it in your office in case they don't have it, and they can use that drug albuterol, which is commonly um, used to combat asthma attacks. Yeah, uh, asthma is on the rise, you know, whatever the reason and the cause is, you know, it's kind of unknown whether it's better diagnosis, whether it's the hygiene theory, all of these things are potential factors, uh, but it is on the rise, so it's very important to recognize that in our patients, make sure that they have their um, their and albuterol inhalers. on their inhalers mm -hmm. on them. If not, you should always have a little, uh, you know, an inhaler in the emergency kit as a part of, um, you know, those people that don't know it, or they may have such mild asthma that they don't have their inhaler with them, but they get a severe allergic attack for a reason one reason or another uh, in that environment. So what about one of the um, less common type of uh, medical emergencies uh, in the average general office, which is on the other hand could be a very severe and significant consequence being chest pains. Of course, whenever you have a patient that tells you they have chest pains while you're treating them, I'm sure that is something that you uh, very quickly. That may cause you to have chest pain. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, that prevention of, of this emergency is, is most important. You'll find patients who come in who will tell you right off the bat um, that they suffer from angina and by looking at a list of their pharmacology, all the medicines that they take, um, that right there is a red flag for that patient that he potentially could have an incident in your office. So as soon as you see a patient who's taking diuretics, um, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, um, any type of nitroglycerin if they tell you they require it. Um, digitalis is another cardiac drug that you can be um, aware of. Yeah. Um, whenever you see that and you, a patient will tell you that they have congestive heart failure, always assume that that in fact um, can be a possibility. Now certainly being aware of that, that will modify how you treat that patient. Um, precautionary measures, um, controlling the amount of epinephrine that you'd give that patient is certainly one of the uh, most prudent things you can do. Um, calling that patient's physician before he even gets treatment uh, for any type of precautions or potentially sedation that that patient should have so that his stress levels are very much reduced. These are all factors that can go a long way in preventing a problem. Yeah. How, let, me, let me ask yeah. you one, one, one point of um, um, that I usually um, kind of bring up is this issue of epinephrine because a lot of patients tell you they're allergic to epinephrine or they have reactions to epinephrine. None of them is really a true situation because no. obviously they've had a 
poor incidence of getting an intervascular injection. And unfortunately, that dentist, instead of just telling them that they had a misfortunate intervascular accident of the epinephrine tells the patient that you're allergic to epinephrine and to avoid right. it, and that's right. not true. Especially, what the purpose of epinephrine in the um, in the local anesthetic is is to actually extend the pulpal anesthesia. Right. So, the presence of local anesthetic or with epinephrine in the local anesthetic in endodontic therapy is paramount because pulpal anesthesia is required for a significant length of time. And if you do use an anesthetic that doesn't have epinephrine in there, your pulpal anesthesia drops down dramatically, which could potentially lead to a painful response by the patient by which the patient reduce, releases endogenous epinephrine that far surpasses any epinephrine okay, right. that you would be giving them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we talked about asthma and some of its consequences. What about chest pain? Be several arrest? things. Yeah. Um, very commonly, it can be gastrointestinal reflux. Because the patient's sitting down, he may have burning in his chest because he's got reflux. Heartburn, Heartburn versus yes. differentiate. Um, it, could be, it could be intercostal muscle strain, which can be um, misconstrued as, as cardiac pain. But the two things that we're concerned about, and we'll differentiate between those two, are angina and myocardial infarction. With angina, the patient's going to probably tell you that in his history. You'll see in his meds that he probably takes nitroglycerin. And if, in fact, the patient does have angina and has difficulty and pain in his chest, by giving him nitroglycerin, that pain should be alleviated. Now, very, very important in, in his medical history, and at the beginning of the appointment, you've got to take his vitals. So you're going to take blood pressure, you're going to take pulse. If a patient, after experiencing this, has a vital where he has a systolic blood pressure of under 90, nitroglycerin is contraindicated. At that point in time, if he's having pain, that patient has to be given oxygen and transported immediately to the hospital. Um, if his systolic is above, certainly nitroglycerin is an option for him. Yeah, I mean, in a sense also, if you think about it, a patient that has chest pain, it seems like uh, it has to do with the amount of risk tolerance any given uh, operator has to whether they're going to immediately call the emergency uh, number or they're going to kind of try to triage it. I mean, obviously, I think that it's best to properly triage the patient first based on their medical history, their specific profile. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're having a patient that is much older compared to one that is, you know, on the younger side, then you're going to assume different things. But at the same time, you know, having the vitals, having the, uh, the blood pressure and then triaging through the history and seeing if you can get away with just giving nitroglycerin to the patient. Right. And if they don't recover, then it's very important to send them to the emergency room right away uh, because clearly that could be signs. You know, a chest pain that doesn't resolve could be heartburn, but the consequence of being wrong and it being an MI are, it's just not worth the risk. No, you, right? you don't want to take the chance. So what we're going to do is we're going to differentiate the angina, which is just straight chest pain, which is treated with nitroglycerin, to a myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction is not only pain in the chest, but it's pain which radiates to a couple of the extremities. It can radiate to the left shoulder generally, the arm, and even the jaw. In that particular case, with a myocardial infarction, they have the acronym MONA. Mm. where you'd give the patient morphine for the pain, certainly oxygen, get him into a, a supine or Trendelenburg position, and have the patient immediately bite on an aspirin, a minimum of 162 right. milligrams. And at that point in time, you've got to call for help and that patient should be transported to the, to the ER. Right, of course, I mean, the Mona protocol usually gets started in the, you know, once the uh, paramedics get there, because I think most dental offices, we don't really have morphine around. No, I no, mean, no, uh, we so that's, but the, but the aspirin is very important. I mean, getting yes. the aspirin in them in their mouth so that it could, it's been shown to actually help reduce the, right. uh, the issues. Yes. Uh, and if not, it could lead into a cardiac arrest and it could very well be the case that you could walk into the operatory and the patient's already had the uh, the cardiac arrest and in those cases then what do you what do you do in that case well in, I mean, in first of all the diagnosis of it how do you how do we diagnose it at that point right the diagnosis is when you check for vitals um, there's no, <laughs> pulse, no pulse and, and there's no respiration yeah, no breathing. at that point in time 
because it's recent, it's within three to five minutes, um, it may or may not have been witnessed. As long as there's any kind of electrical activity in the heart, that patient should be have a defibrillator, an AED right. device placed on them, and certainly we want to shock the heart to see if we can reestablish a normal rhythm. What the AED does is it actually stops the heart, which is pumping ineffectively, and resets it. It's like rebooting it on your computer. When you do that, theoretically, the heart should come back and beat in a normal rhythm. At that point in time, certainly that patient should be monitored and uh, transferred for further care. Yeah, I mean, the AED, the automatic electronic defibrillator, right. is now a standard of care, at least here in Massachusetts, in terms of having it in the practice and in your yes. office. So cardiac arrest, to talk about AED, obviously leads to the natural um, next step, which is CPR. Uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So any changes in the CPR protocol? It's slightly changed at this point in time, depending on if there's one or two rescuers. If there's one rescuer, you're simply giving two breaths quickly, noting chest rise to make sure that the um, you're getting air or potentially oxygen into the lungs, and then you're initiating CPR. And CPR is approximately 100 to 120 uh, compressions per minute. Uh, in an adult patient between two and two and a half inches of chest compression and you're doing it for until you become exhausted until uh, the emergency staff arrives or until you re-establish a regular heart rate on the patient so you're going until any of those three factors takes place now if you have someone else in the office then you have can have two man unit where the ratio is 30 compressions to two breaths and what you would do is you continue on to about five cycles and then in order to avoid fatigue you'd switch positions yeah. now positioning for CPR obviously the best position is on the floor where you have a solid surface Surface and you can certainly do that. In a dental office, if it happens in a chair, what you're doing is you're placing the chair back, you're supporting the head with your stool, and you're commencing CPR like that. Yeah, it's very important. And I think one of the more modern changes in the CPR protocol has been the emphasis on compressions compared to breathing. Right. So compression and, uh, you know, has become a little bit more important. We talked about cardiac uh, arrests and chest pains and these things. What about the next step being seizures? Some of the other things that we end up seeing probably more grand mal seizures. Yeah, the petite mal we wouldn't worry about. Yeah. That, that's very transient and it may involve, say, flickering of the eyelids, but it's almost uh, imperceptible to anyone around the patient. We're more concerned with grand mal seizures and patients who are predisposed to that uh, are probably patients who've suffered brain damage in the past. Patients who have a history of epilepsy, again, you should discern that from your medical history. And especially patients who are hypoglycemic, in rare cases, they can have uh, seizures. And to treat seizures, it's very easy to recognize, obviously, to treat them, whatever you had in their mouths, get it out, whether it's a rubber dam, any kind of bite blocks, anything like that, take it out of their mouth so there's no risk of them aspirating anything. Clear the area so while they're having their seizure, they can't hurt them or hurt you and allow the seizure to take place. Most often it's over within a minute or so. If it goes longer than, say, three minutes, um, that's an indication that you can, in fact, use a benzodiazepine. Midazolam can be used two to three milligrams mm -hmm. intramuscularly. Valium, say, 10 milligrams intramuscularly. That will help to control or break the seizure pattern and that's an effective way of, of controlling things there. All right. right, so we talked about seizures. What about the, the one that I think is actually probably much more common, diabetic emergencies, whether it's hypoglycemia or if it's hyperglycemia, and hypoglycemia obviously being the most common. Right, with, with diabetic patients, we, we'd like to know HbA1c levels. That, that's a very accurate measurement of, of their control. Certainly if it's under seven, we're not that concerned, but if it's over seven, it may raise our eyebrows a little to the fact that we might have a complication. Now, if they haven't had a recent HbA1c, we can certainly ask them about if they have a glucometer, they have blood sugar levels, they should be in the range depending on how frequently they've eaten or how soon they've eaten before, should be anywhere between 100 and 180. If it's above that, certainly that's a control issue. But we wouldn't worry that much about it because between hyper and hypoglycemia, we're more concerned with hypoglycemia. That turned into a very serious problem for us. So what will happen with patients that 
in fact experience hypoglycemia, they will start to become agitated, they may become disoriented, their heart rate may increase, they may become quite restless, and it's easy to discern. And as soon as you see that, stop whatever you're doing and provide that patient with a source of carbohydrate. Now, many of the beverages that are on the market today have artificial sweeteners. Those are totally ineffective for this kind of thing, so it must be a source of Assuming glucose. Too many Diet Coke is not gonna help for No, you. no, sorry. It might be good for your waistline, but it's not good for your diabetes, <laughs> sorry. So anything like a fruit juice, a non-diet soda would be great, and um, they will, because it gets into the bloodstream so quickly, they'll in fact uh, recover quite quickly. An important note about treating those patients, and I think we mentioned this in one of our other videos, is when you're treating a patient who does not have good control, very important to treat them in the morning. They've probably eaten relatively recently and their endogenous cortisol levels are quite high in the morning compared to the rest of the day. And cortisol, as we know, tends to mobilize glucose from the bloodstream. We've talked about all of these uh, different uh, potential emergencies, or the most common ones, these uh, seven uh, common emergencies that people can run into in their medical uh, into dental practice. Let's talk about some of the ingredients that people should have in their office too, to kind of address these uh, emergencies. But before we do that, let's walk away because while we've been talking, I think I've been bitten already by like so many mosquitoes. I think so we're you, gonna need some malaria. contribution, yeah. huh? Exactly. I think I'm gonna get malaria by the time I'm done with this video. Or need so, a transfusion. <laughs> exactly. So um, let's, uh, let's, let's move on and let's uh, right. talk some more. Okay. All right, so Ian, let's talk about some of the basic emergency components of an emergency kit that should be probably in every dental office, right? Right. And there's a whole range of them, obviously. You know, we're talking about like, you know, oxygen, obviously, is one of them. So right. tell me the first one. That's probably the most common one that should be used in almost all emergencies. Yeah, the, the, most, the most common uh, component of an emergency kit would definitely be oxygen. Every office should have oxygen. It, it's used in virtually every type of dental emergency that you're likely to encounter, uh, except for hyperventilation. Right. So in cases where a patient is fainted, car in cardiac problems, it's always used. So generally speaking, when you're delivering oxygen, it should be, depending on the size of the patient, six to 10 liters per minute. And if a patient is apneic or have a difficulty breathing, you have to use positive pressure oxygen. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, when an emergency situation arises in an office, there's panic that sets in. Everybody should have a protocol. They should all know where is that oxygen tank so you have readily ready access to it and how do you use it? How do you turn it on? You can't have an oxygen tank and try to figure out where the wrench is to open the oxygen valve. You've got to know. So every once in a while in an office, you should practice these kinds of things. Go drills, through right? drills. Go through a, a simulated situation where you have to use these kinds of uh, devices and make sure that everybody knows how to use them and where it's located. Sometimes. I walk into the operatory and I pretend like I'm, you know, passed out and I have people come in and, you know, do see if we have all the drills right. And of course, one of these days, I'm going to be the the little uh, the boy who cried wolf, and they're going to find me uh, can, passed out, and they'd be you like, "You can it's, never be it's the just another drill." No. In, right? in, in in an office, you can never be the boy who cried wolf because <laughs> you can never be too prepared for one of these things because exactly. you can save someone's life. Absolutely, epinephrine is another one of those common ones, right? Definitely, in the form of an epipen, right? In a form of an epipen, or you can have it in vials which have been prior have been drawn up, or. Um, and, and have it readily accessible. So have mm -hmm. it in syringes so you can use it. Now, in cases of medical emergencies, we're not using the type of, uh, type of epinephrine that we use in an anesthetic, which is one in 100 or one in 200,000. We're using one in 1,000, and we're generally giving it in 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 milligrams. Oftentimes, we're not well-trained enough to do an IV, especially in an emergency situation, so we're doing it intramuscularly, either in the deltoid muscle and the gluteus. In that, we can get our epinephrine delivered and we can potentially note its effects. Exactly. And of course, you know, the, as we talked about the EpiPen being one of the easier, more commercially available way of doing, uh, of delivering the epinephrine, right. uh, you know, it's very important to make sure that you or your assistant or somebody in charge of the emergency kit is constantly checking expiration dates on these drugs because yep. they expire and you don't want to give somebody expired 
<laughs> epinephrine. No, no, right? it won't have the same potency. So every three, four months, have someone who's in your office look through the kit, anything that has expired or is about to expire, make sure it's replaced so you have a fresh store on hand. Exactly. So nitroglycerine is another drug that I think would should right. fit into that big, list. Big drug, big drug for treatment of angina. Um, it can offset some of the effects when a patient's having myocardial infarction. Now that's given in tablets which dissolve underneath the tongue. The problem with it is it has a, a very, very short shelf life and at the same time it has to be protected from sunlight. So as soon as you open the bottle, as soon as you use it, make sure you replace it. It's very, very important to do that. Yeah, so and also obviously Obviously, some of the other uh, medications that are used for allergies, you know, whether it's, you know, histamines or steroids, obviously, I would think the injectable antihistamines are right. probably... Right, so we're, we're usually using Benadryl, diphenhydramine. Mm -hmm. uh, Benadryl is, is supplied usually 25 milligram vials, so it can be used anywhere between 25 and 50 milligrams. Again, because it's hard to go intra intravenously, we're putting it intramuscularly, and it has a much quicker onset than if you were to give it orally. But for mild allergic reactions, certainly keep a, some tablets in the office, and, and it can be given orally for cases where it's quite mild. Yeah, and that, that's, a, that's another important one. Speaking of allergies, asthmatic medications such as albuterol, you know, an inhaler. Right. Uh, also, again, the expiration date on those is uh, very quick. It, you, have to, you have to be very, very cognizant yeah. of when that expires. Those inhalers are single use, obviously. So you use it, it has to be discarded, replace it. When you're dealing with beta agonists, so they will cause vasodilation of the bronchial passages without any cardiac effects. So that also leads to some one of the oldest drugs or medications that has been around since the ancient times, yep. the bark of the willow tree. It is. <laughs> Aspirin, yep. right? Yep. So aspirin obviously should be a part of the medical emergency kid. Why? A aspirin is proven to um, stop the progression uh, from a myocardial infarction to the more serious type of total blockage of heart blood vessels. It, it's been proven. You've got to be careful. There are not many contraindications. It has a very high therapeutic value. However, there are certain patients you cannot give it to. Obviously, patients who are sensitive to aspirin and patients who have any type of gastrointestinal problems, they should not have aspirin. Or any patients who have a history of asthma, it can precipitate an asthma attack. But outside of those patients, as aspirin's a very, very safe drug and used in, in uh, with in cases of myocardial infarction, very, very effective. It's proven to be effective. So another one of those basic ones that should be in the kit. And of course, last but not least, uh, for treatment of patients with hypoglycemia, some kind of a carbohydrate right. would be helpful. Ve and we discussed this before. So any, any type of natural fruit juice is good. Anything that has glucose in it, because glucose is rapidly absorbed into the bloodstream, it can certainly counteract any effects where hypoglycemia is in, is is a problem and you'll notice the patient will recover quite rapidly after they've gotten um, that into their systems. Well, Ian, this has been a wonderful uh, review. And I think uh, given the fact that we've had this huge hike and I'm, <laughs> and I'm highly hypoglycemic at this point, I think we should go get something and yeah. maybe wrap it up and do a little quick summary at that point. Yeah. Uh, so I let's agree. go grab a couple bites. Thank you very All much. Right. I think what we'll do is we'll start off with sink a beep. Hold on, let's move this plane to pass. We've never seen a forest <laughs> that has been so loud with, you know. These are very, very large birds. <laughs> I know. <laughs> very large. <laughs> All right. So, so you think like we're in some kind of a tropical forest next to like a military uh, site no, where they're like bringing all it's, this. It's a constant barrage of airplanes. <laughs> Looks like I'm going to be having hyperventilation. There's so much pollen in the air over here. It's like no, we're getting to allergic reactions. That's later down on the list. Okay, so I should hold hold, hold, hold off. Hold off. Hold off. So hold okay. on a second. Let's cut right. this. <clears throat> Sorry, you guys. Go ahead. Oh, hi there. Hi there. Oh, are you? No, no, go ahead. Just no, pass. Ahead. We'll, we'll edit you out. Don't worry. <laughs> All right.
good spot. That's <laughs> the only spot where we can sit. <laughs> <clears throat> Jesus, so many mosquitoes here, man.